Here is how things end, not with some grand drama, but with a shameful scuffle in a gate. All right, fine. Today we're gonna talk about the wisdom of crowds. I finished this book last night. I went to bed angry at Joe. And here I am today, this morning, in mourning. This book was excellent. I loved this trilogy. I enjoyed the Age of Madness trilogy even more than the First Law trilogy. You can't really tell. I've rearranged my shelves and they're outward facing now. The, I've switched my which Abercrombie book is outward facing and now it's Age of Madness. But then I sit in front of it, so I need to, I need to sort that out. But anyway, what an excellent conclusion to the trilogy. Joe has taken me through the ringer. Like, my goodness, the way he has had, he has gotten me attached to these characters and then harmed me through harming them. Incredible. Rude. Go right there. All right, so. Actually, I need that. What a incredible and depressing book I just read. It was so phenomenal. From the jump, right off the bat, we dive into the chaos of this rebellion. Joe did such a good job of really depicting it and showing the common man, showing the common man in the rebellion and what they so quickly kind of descend into. Uh, he did such a good job of showing the rebellion not as a group of people rising up, united for a greater cause, but rather as chaos and um, senseless, senseless chaos that they just kind of descended into this. Kyle just started stabbing and Doors was in shock at, at what was happening. Uh, and he said, had to be done, had to be done. Doors didn't see why. It wasn't like this fool had set their wages. They could have given him a kicking, taught him a lesson, left it at that. But whether it had, been, but whether it had to be done or not, it was done now, no undoing it. So then Doors leads him on and it says, didn't know what had happened when they got there, just like they hadn't known what had happened when they started kicking that officer. Regrets were for tomorrow. So it showed the chaos of the people, but it also showed, he showed the chaos through Judge very, very well, how she was really a wild card. Any scene that she was in, you kind of just didn't know what was going to happen and didn't feel like anything was safe because she wasn't this greater sense of justice. She was this form of chaos um, in, in, in her actions. One scene that really uh, hit me with the judge was, I guess, probably a very obvious one, the one where people were being forced to jump from the tower of, of chains. That scene was so dark. Uh, it wasn't, Joe writes scenes of violence and betrayal and of brutality and torture, but this scene managed to be as dark as some of his most gruesome scenes, um, even though it wasn't that. Too many principles did not work for us. So we'll try none at all. Her voice had become a disbelieving shriek. The time for half measures is past. Pike looked evenly back at her. Sometimes the only way to improve something is to destroy it so it can, re so it can be rebuilt better. Sometimes to change the world, we must first burn it down. Another little speck tumbled from the top of the Tower of Chains. Beyond the ruined walls of, of Agriant, the crowd applauded. Just really really gruesome without being really gruesome. <laughs> um, still speaking of Judge, I love, again, she's just just such a wild card, you know? Um, like the scene when, when they, bef right before the Tower of Chains, uh, with respect, you have no warrant here. You sure? Brother Sharvey, could you produce our credentials? With pleasure, a rat-faced burner with red spattered cap stepped forward, sliding his hand into his jacket pocket. He brought it up in front of the secretary. There was nothing there but a fist. He smashed it into her face and knocked her down, her head bouncing on the tiles. She was left gazing up in amazement with blood running from her broken bones. Then later, uh, Rizinu, I don't know how to say his name, uh, says, I'll call the, I'll call the weaver. Judge's red-rimmed eyes slid sideways to him. Who do you think gave me the keys to the chamber, you fat fool? 
I know I shouldn't just spend this entire review reading uh, reading you quotes, but I kind of want to just spend this entire review reading you quotes. I just think I... Judge was just such a phenomenal antagonist. Um, even though I expected her to have a more on-page presence in this book, phenomenal, phenomenal antagonist. Uh, who should we talk about next? How about Leo? Boy, oh boy, was I wrong about Leo. Man, in the last, in my last book review, in, in The Trouble with Peace, I gave that boy so much benefit of the doubt. Here I am saying, oh, he has good intentions, he's trying, he's just being manipulated by the council. I can't imagine. See, do you remember in the last review when I said that I'm a bad judge of character? I'm not good at being able to tell when somebody sucks and I just kind of assume that everybody's trying to be nice to me and then here I am thinking, oh, Leo, he's wonderful. No, I don't think he's wonderful. I think that he is a tragic story, but instead, I hate him. I hate him. He he's my most hated character in the series. Bring Judge back, kill Leo. What a horrible human being. What a horrible, nasty man. Dadgummit. In the, in the uh, beginning of the book, when he's being dragged by his wife, by Savine, um, and this depiction here, the young lion had his right arm around his wife's shoulders, his gaunt face scattered with scabs and twisted with pain, moving in lurching hops, his left arm uselessly dangling, and one trouser leg rolled up to the stump. Savine had one arm around her husband, the other under her swollen belly, struggling along with back bent and teeth bared, tufts of dark hair sticking from the... It's just the way he described... Here I am looking at these two people struggling to survive, and yes, they make terrible decisions, and yes, they're cunning and manipulative, but they're doing their darndest in a really dark situation. What a fool I was! Leo, uh, looking more and more like his grandfather, like Glockta, but a less lovable Glockta, cunning, manipulative, conniving. He, uh, essentially puts his wife, I mean, he puts her in danger. He, keeps justifying everything as, oh, well, she'll understand. They'll understand. It has to be done. Everything has to be done. It all has to be done. He even at one point puts his wife and his children in danger for the greater good. Like this scene here. But your children. If Savine runs, Judge will know we broke the deal and it will be over. She has to trust me. Trust enough anyway. That's the only way that this uh, that this has a chance of working. He's willing to risk everyone. Even his relationship with Jurand, which I think was very fascinating to, to follow, to watch them kind of come back together and um, figure out how they feel about each other and that loyalty that they had. I really enjoyed reading their loyalty. But he's a horrible human. It's like, do you remember the scene when uh, he was in front of a crowd and he was trying to get a new king declared and they were like, what? Okay, what about the current king? You don't just dethrone a king. It's not that simple. And, and he's just like, I'm not worried about it, okay? So don't worry about it. But he becomes so self-absorbed and so nasty where uh, he's, he's bitter at his mother and bitter at his wife for not admiring him enough, for not giving him enough attention and bitter at the world for not appreciating him. He just becomes so nasty. Uh, the scene where the tables have turned and Orso and, and them are, are flinging people off the tower was an excellent one uh, where Broad, no one was expecting it, just complete shock to everybody involved. Broad just steps forward and pushes Bannerman off the tower and then chaos. Broad grabs someone's ankle and yanks it up and flings them over the edge. Orso stabs Halder. And then Savine. Savine was the star of this, where she grabs a hold of Judge and Judge is like, I'm taking you down with me. And she goes, you sure are. And she just launches herself off of the tower. Thankfully, she doesn't die. But my goodness, that scene, I'm not even talking about Savine yet, but she stole the show in this scene. And then that scene is followed by Orso, good, loyal, wonderful Orso, 
declaring that things are gonna change. No more riots, no more trials, no more executions, no vengeance, no settling of scores, no court of the people. There can be no more closed counsel, no corruption and injustice, no dead grip of valent and bulk around the throat of the nation. This time, I mean to govern for the many, not the few, to be king for everyone, or so. <sighs> I've never reacted to a scene like I reacted to this scene here. I've never reacted to a scene in such a physical way. I was sitting, I was sitting here with this book, not here, upstairs, and when I read this scene where Lord Brock betrays Orso, I reacted so I recoiled from the scene so hard that the book fell out of my hands. Never have I done that. Never have I ever, I've, I've reacted, physically reacted to scenes before, but I've never physically reacted so strongly that I lost control of the book. My goodness, he turns. I owe you, Lord Brock, said Orso, since it seemed they were all going back to their old titles. I have had our, we have had our differences. We could hardly have bigger ones, but if men like us can march into the future together, there is hope for anyone. He offered his hand. There is hope for everyone. Brock winced down at Orso's open, open palm, taking a deep breath as if composing himself for some distasteful task. Not everyone, he said, and then produced a dagger from behind his back and stabbed Forrest in the chest. At the same mo moment, Orso felt himself gripped from behind, a blade pressed to his throat. I can't believe, I can't believe Leo. I hate Leo. And everything that follows with Savine wanting him to be let go, Savine saying, this is not what we said, this is not what we agreed on, this is not what I want for this plan of ours. And he's just like, take, someone take my wife to, to our children. They need their mother. Just, just shutting her down, ignoring her, stepping over her, stepping on her to get to his victory, to get to his moment. What a pitiful excuse for a man. Um, this is another one that shows what a, atrocious human he is. We're, we are, this is someone else talking, I don't remember who, I think Savine. Yeah, it's Savine. We are better than judge. Otherwise, what is the point? The point is we win. What a putrid man. I just, I despise, I despise him. I can't believe I was on his side in book two. I was being all empathetic. I was seeing that he was following in his granddad's footsteps, that he was he was not going the path he should be. But here I am thinking, oh, he's just, he's trying though. He, he betrayed me. <sighs> the characters that commit betrayal and that do all these horrendous things to each other in Abercrombie's books are always so humanized. They're always, they're, you, there's just a glimpse of, of something in them to latch onto and to care for. And Leo has none of it. Leo is just pure hate, pure hate. Savine, um, she is, I love her still. I'm sorry, I do. I love her still. I think that she's changed a lot. You can argue with me about it. I don't know what the common opinion on her is. I think she's changed. We got several moments of her really starting to care. She's still cunning, she's still manipulative, she still thinks through every situation and how it could benefit her and how it could benefit her greater plans. She's not a good guy, but I do think that she's changed a lot. Becoming a mother mattered a great deal to her. It was incredibly valuable to her. And seeing her kind of essentially say, look, I've done some, I've done a lot of wrong in my life. And these two kids, this is my chance to actually do something right. This is my chance to actually be some somebody that's worth something. And I love that about her. I loved her scene with Rika when they got back together and they were like, hey, you're still wearing, you still got the necklace. You still have, here, here's some pearl dust. All right, well, here's, here's some, you try, you, here's some chew or chow or whatever she called it. How, how Savine was looking at Rika and looking how gussied up she was. And she was just like, look at her. Look at her. She looks amazing. I loved seeing them bond together. And even when, when they were like, who was it? I think it was Rico that first said, well, I betrayed you. No, no, no. I think it was, it was Savine that was like, I betrayed you. And Rico goes, and I betrayed you. It's what we do. It happens. 
no worries. <laughs> it's all good. At least we like each other, so it's fine to be betrayed by someone you like, right? We all have our reasons. Her scene with the orphans, like, she cares. She cares. It's all strategic. It's all, there's a reason behind everything that she does, but she cares about them. And that scene when she went to the orphanage and she said that she had pictured having a line of cots of, of well-groomed, nice, orphans and what she saw was actual tragedy and I don't know I feel like she's reckoning with the reality of this world and the reality of of how she's participated in it and she actually cares she actually cares she didn't want Orso to be betrayed she did want the rebellion but she wanted it for di she didn't want it like that she didn't want things to go like this I love Sabine. I loved her scene with Judge that I've already gone over with the tower. I think she's phenomenal. She's smart, she's crafty. The way she handled going to trial and she bring, brought her babies with her and she was nursing during the trial and like, she's smart and I love her. Rika is another character that I absolutely adore. She had me, she had me running in this, in this book. Oh my goodness, between, um, <clears throat> that conversation that she had with Baez, that scene that she had with Baez, that was incredible. She's so smart. Oh my goodness. I, I don't have time to keep just sitting here looking up quotes. I've already wasted too much time doing that, but maybe I could a little bit more. Why, you must know that with a thought I could make you, I could make ash of you. No, she said brightly, I don't see it. Oh my goodness, listen at her. She's so brave, she's so ballsy. The fact that she, this whole time, has been making up her visions, that she hasn't seen a vision since her father's death and she's just giving the people what they want. She's just giving them some hope, some idea, some inkling for the future. The whole thing with Nail, I love them as a couple. I actually really root for them. They, their coupling at the beginning, them hooking up in the beginning was so endearingly awkward, which is Joe's style, isn't it? But their, everything in the beginning with the two of them, and how that escalated their their uh, plan, <laughs> their great deception, the two of them. And then her ultimate betrayal of Orso was horrible. The scene where Orso was betrayed once again. <laughs> Just, ow! I can't believe my boy. I feel confident at this point that you're tired of listening to me read quotes, but I refuse to export this video until this one is read. I saw a wolf eat the sun, or so pondered that. Well, I'm no Magnus, learned in the interpretation of visions, but I'd say that's Stour Nightfall making war on the Union. I saw a lion eat the wolf. He sat back, rather enjoying the game, the young lion beating the great wolf in the circle. I saw a lamb eat the lion. Orso could not help but grin. That was me, giving Brock a richly deserved kick up the ass at Stauffenbeck. I saw an owl eat the lamb. Orso's grin faded. Who's the owl? No idea. Now she looked at him with the strangest, saddest expression. Till now. He was starting to feel worried. What is it? I'm the owl, she said. The doors of the dining room swung open. Call Shivers was the first in, metal eye glinting. Next came the two Englanders Orso had often seen in the front benches of the Court of the People. The big one, the lean one, glowered and jurand. The final guest was announced before his appearance by the squeaking of the bearings of his artificial leg, accompanied by that familiar sinking sensation of dashed hope. Leo Dan Brock. I guess we can move on and talk about Orso now. He turns himself over to the Breakers. Um, the age of the wizard is over. He, he tried. <laughs> He so tried. I am a little bit disappointed that he's not more, that there's not more presence of him in this book. I wish he had done more in this book, but at the same time, I feel like that's kind of indicative to what his character was. A truly good man, truly trying to create a system that works and that is for the people and, and his inherent goodness, right? He's he's like the one character that you can look at and say, you are trying, you're a truly good guy. Like, it's not like, 
layered where, oh, there's goodness shining through all that muck and grime around you. He was truly good, but I guess that's, that's the character, isn't it? Truly good and completely ineffectual. Couldn't actually do anything. And that's what he was in this book. Truly good. And I wanted to see him succeed somewhere, but he couldn't do a thing. And the, the ending with his speech before he was hanged gutted me gutted me. I'm so sad to lose Orso. I cared about him. And I care about so many characters in this series. I care about so many characters. And when people die, when Wonderful dies, when Gorst dies, so many people that I care about that I don't want to see go. But Orso, it just hit different, you know? But yeah, we lost Stour. We lost Gorst. That one gutted me. That one killed me, especially because, must, much like Orso, it was fruitless. It was his sacrifice hurt me so badly, and the fact that it didn't really do anything, you know? It didn't really get us any time. It was useless, just like Orso's entire mission and goal and everything. It destroyed me. It was... Ah! Oh, man. Okay, a couple of other things that were phenomenal. Um, Glockta. I knew Joe wouldn't do that to me. I knew he wouldn't just have Glockta go away and then it's all over. We won't hear from him again in this trilogy. No, he... No. He was the one pulling the strings. He was the mastermind behind it all. Um, I have some thoughts on that, but the conversation that he had with Savine just killed me. I mean, the conversation he had with Ricca, excellent. The conversation he had with Savine, so sad. He did all this for her. He did all this to put her on the throne because he knew, because he, uh, and her reaction, what was it that she said to him? You freed us from Baez so you could become Baez? Baez? How do you say his name? Oh man, I love the reveal that it was Glockta pulling the strings the whole time, that it wasn't all Pike. Uh, I, I love that reveal. I questioned it. I questioned when it was revealed that Pike was the weaver. I questioned, there's no way Glockta didn't know, you know? And it all came together really nicely. I do wish I have a couple, I have a couple of structural things that I have nitpicks about. Um, Glockta being one of them, I wish it wasn't just he did everything from afar. Somehow, I wish that it, he was more, he was more close to this story to reveal that he was the one that did it all the time, all this time, rather than, you know, surprise, this guy who wasn't here was was the mastermind. I wish Baez was a little bit more, Baez was a bit more of a presence. I understand that in the first trilogy, he had put everything, he had, he had weaved everything together in a way that when he brought it all crumbling to the ground, there was a net there to catch what he needed caught. Like he, it was all so beautifully strategized. And in this one, this one took place over such a short period of time. Uh, this was essentially a blind spot for him. He just didn't see this coming. Um, I think that he just doesn't have that much magic left in him, and that's probably a factor. And you can only burn everything to the ground so many times before there's nothing left. And this all happened so fast. He didn't have time to see what he wasn't seeing and then to create something I don't know, but I do wish that there was more here. Does that make sense? Am I making any sense? I don't feel like I am. I don't know. I just think that Joe <laughs> knows how to write characters. The journey that he's taken me through with these characters, the sense of love and appreciation that I have for some of them and the sense of betrayal I feel from others, relief that some have made it out alive, so happy to see Shivers is still good, and the devastation of losing others. Oh, I didn't even talk about Clover. Clover, is such a turncoat, going back and forth, never knowing what side he's on. That entire scene with him and, um, well, it was, uh, Downside. Him and Downside, where he just kept killing everyone! He just kept killing everyone! Um, there was a crack and Clover blinked, splattered his face down. Downside was split, Downside had spit the bas split the bastard's head too. What the, sounding a bit feudy to me, chief, said Downside, wiping his ax. And he gets so irritated. He's like, you can't just keep killing everybody. He's like, I don't see why not. That scene 
was genius. That scene was so funny. There's so much humor in these books and so such great relationships between these characters. But Clover, um, he was so fun. I don't, he didn't feel like the most in the most important piece of the whole the whole game that was being played, but I enjoyed every single scene that we had with him and I'm happy to see he's doing fine. I don't know, he just writes characters so well that even the side characters that don't have a POV, that don't have a, a, a place, Oh my goodness, um, like Zuri. Oh my goodness, Zuri. Ugh, there's too much to talk about. There's too much to talk about in these books. Even characters that don't actually have a dedicated POV, it's just, they're so strong. Their voice, their mannerisms, everything that they do is so strong in its own right. These characters are incredible. The fact that he can take someone like Leo, who in the beginning looks like he has potential to be a great king, and Orso, who looks like a freaking clown, and then just switch them out on me and switch out how I feel about them is truly, it's genius. <sighs> The message Joe was giving was so poignant, so relevant. Um, the, the way that he depicted it all was so great. The characters, they won me over so well. I had my doubts going into this trilogy, the next generation, you know, like let's, let's bring back some, some characters that you care about and are invested in so that I can immediately bank on your nostalgia and then introduce some new characters and try to make them strong enough, no. It was excellent. I have some nitpicks. I think if I look at the structure of it all and I look at everything, then I see some cracks. But as someone who's more of a character and themes reader, this trilogy just killed it. Just knocked it out of the park. Killed me. All right, I have to go. Uh, my daughter's about to get home from school, so I gotta go, but. I, I hope I, I hope you'll keep talking to me about about this. I hope you'll tell me who your favorite character was, what your favorite scenes were. How's your leg? I post videos every Tuesday and Thursday. This one came out on a Wednesday. Sorry about that. Uh, on this channel, Mondays and Fridays on the main channel. I'll see you again soon. Bye.